<laughs> because you said that the try would be called try but triceratops the try is called tri. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that tricycle would be spelled T R Y because you try yeah. to pedal? Yeah. Wait. Yeah. I thought it had three wheels. Yeah, right. It's T R I because it has three wheels. Try T R I. Tri Triceratops has three horns. Okay, everybody, I talked about the Industrial Revolution, correct? I talked about Marxism. We talked about photography. We talked about the uh, Salon de, uh, de Refusé, right? And we started talking about uh, Corbet. Did we talk about burial at Ornan? Did we talk about the Stonebreakers? All right. We talked about how it got all blowed up, right? I think we stopped on this painting right here. The artist studio. Okay. All right. All right. Hey, this is how big it is. In Texas, we call that a big one. All right, another photo showing how big it is. All right, things that are real and things that are allegories, those are two, like a real allegory, That those are two opposite words. It's kind of like a jumbo shrimp. It's an oxymoron. So things that are real, that's the unpleasant truth. And things that are allegories, that is a story told with symbols. So uh, is, take it all in. We're going to look at different parts of it. So in the center, we have an artist admiring the landscape that he is painting. We have a nude model beside him. Her dress is at her feet. And this is a common sight in an artist studio of having a model there. But he is not painting a nude. So the real part is that she is a model for the artist. The allegory part of this is that she symbolizes truth or liberty or beauty or, some, or something of that nature. The boy would represent innocence and the cat might represent liberty or freedom in this instance. All right, we have divided the painting into two groups. There's a group to the left of the artist and there's a group to the right of the artist. To the left of the artist, we see fairly rough, rough types. Uh, they are a cast of, of stock characters, a woodsman, a village idiot, a Jew, and others. There are several other allusions, such as the inclusion for the current ruler of ne uh, France, Napoleon. I'm looking at which one. That might be the guy in the, that's seated on the left. And the others are country folk for whom Corbet faces. On the right side of the painting, we have Corbet's wealthy private collectors and his city friends. And at the canvas's extreme right sits Charles Baudelaire. He was a, a poet and a writer at the time. He was a f famous French poet who was close friend of the painter of Corbet. All right, so this painting has often been compared to uh, The Last Judgment, all right? So on the left, we have the blessed that are going into heaven, So and, and then we have the damned on the right, and then we have the creator in the middle. We even have a crucifixion. Uh, let me get my pen. There's a crucifixion right here. So there's a, like a, a bit of a reference to uh, religious artworks.
And it said that that crucifixion, that's a self-portrait of uh, Corbet, just like Michelangelo had a self-portrait right here. So some art historians think that Corbet is making a statement that only artists should make art of things that are real in the real world. So um, and I, do I have it? Yeah. All right. So the people on the left are things of the past, and that is romanticism. You know, they're the characters. They're um, uh, they're characters. All right. And romanticism is a dying art art uh, art style, and we need to make room for realism that is coming in. Uh, into um, fruition. And we should make art of the things that we know. On the right side are people that are real and in front of us. These are his friends, people that he actually knows. And so we are discarding things of the past and embracing things of the present, which will take us into the future. All right. And one of his famous quotes is, show me an angel and I will paint one. So again, this represents the idea of realism, that they'll only do things that are uh, like real in the real world. All right, we're going to move on to Millet, Jean-Francois Millet. Also from France. Everybody got his name? We good to go? All right, this gives you, uh, you've probably seen this painting before. This gives you a sense of how large this painting is. So, <coughs> excuse me, let's take a look at the Gleaners. And I know what you're thinking. I bet you are wondering, what is a Gleaner? So a Gleaner is somebody, at, you have a crop, you have the farmer comes through and he, uh, he reaps the crop and then the gleaners go back in and pick up the things that the farmer missed. All right. So the farmer takes like, you know, 98% of the crop and then the gleaners come by and pick at the last 2%. All right. So that's basically what gleaners do. And uh, gleaning is still a thing that people do. Uh, on, on farms. So this is a cornfield. And in the background, you can see that the corn has already been harvested. Do you see those massive piles on the left? That's corn. Do you see that hay, that wagon that is filled all the way to the top? That's corn. Do you see the people in the distance with big bushels over their shoulders? That's all corn. On the right side in the distance is one person on horseback. So don't know exactly who that is, but it's somebody in power. They're, they're overseeing the group uh, and making sure that they are doing what they're supposed to be doing. It could be a supervisor. It could be the landowner. All right. So, uh, but it is somebody in power there. And then let's take a look at the women. The women are going into the field after the harvest and picking up the leftovers of corn. Now, look at what they have in their hands. Are those massive bushels of food? They're picking at the scraps. Over on the right side is a pile they've already made, all right, and they're looking for more. All right, these are rural beggars. The woman on the left is looking for corn. The woman on the in the center is picking corn and the woman on the right is looking for the next place to glean. <clears throat> and think about what they have in their hand, how much food they have in their hand and how much food the landowner has just reaped. Right. And, and the difference between that, you know, so and these people are are picking so that they can have something to eat tonight. Whereas the landowner is reaping the cornfield to make a profit. So, you know, he knows he's going to eat tonight. These people uh, and they're uh, 
the the three women are picking so that they do have something to eat tonight uh, for their family and possibly children. So the colors are muted, the edges are soft. There's no real hard lines in this painting. So let's take a little brief history of to to really understand like the the um, the not the scandal, but the worrisome message in this painting. We'll take a brief little look at the history of France. So you remember back in, you know, Baroque and Rococo times, it was the monarchy was in charge. And then we had a revolution. And that set up the Republic and we get the neoclassical art like this. And then we have the empire, which is when Napoleon was in power and we had a series of Napoleonic wars. And so the Napoleonic Wars ended with a monarchy, and then we had the revolution of uh, 1830, and then another revolution in 1848. So this is the history of France at this time. Who are the main people that are against each other? There's two main groups that are pitted against each other in, through all this. Aristocracy is one. Right, and then the lower class, everybody else, right? So those are the two uh, uh, groups that are at each other's throats. And think about there's millions of poor rural peasants like the women in the cornfield. And there's only a few rich in the cities. So we have a small number of rich in the cities, a massive amount of uh, poor people. What would happen if the poor people rose up? That's a scary thought for the rich. And at this time, Marx is spreading, you know, there's in the mid 1800s in Europe, the, the difference between the lower class and the upper class is a topic of conversation. You know, people are becoming aware of it. And we've had re several revolutions, three revolutions to topple the monarchy. So it's a it's a thing. It's a thing that people are talking about. It's a thing that people are concerned about. And then Karl Marx doesn't help by saying the only way you can get better is a violent revolution. All right. And so this has the rich paranoid of uh, the masses. And that's what is in this painting. We have the masses, right? The women represent the masses. And then that's the rich right there. All right. So this painting is making a statement of it is unfair for these women to be picking at such scraps while this guy is going to reap up all of this. All right. It's unfair. That's the message here. I'm just looking through my notes right now. Yeah, so like the women are denied access to the abundance. And this is the danger. The message is there's enough food for everybody, but you still need to scavenge for scraps. And this is a common theme in realism. Realism, they're pointing out the difference. You know, since the paintings are no longer about the rich, they're no longer about mythology, they're no longer about the leaders. You know, we're, we're making paintings of the regular people. And by making paintings of the regular people, you're by looking at them, by looking at regular people, you're exposing the problems of the regular people. All right. I'm just going to quickly go through a couple more paintings by Millet. Uh, and they're very similar. So we just say, you know, again, this is genre art. Uh, so we have a couple of uh, rural peasants that are, uh, praying at the end of the day. Um, the, uh, I think, yeah, it's a potato harvest pe peasants. And the bells of the church are ringing in the distance, and so they are stopping to pray. And the painting is not about religion. Millet is, Millet is reminding us, of a, uh, is reminded of his grandmother, who, when hearing the bells of the church, would stop in the middle of the field to pray for the souls that have departed. 
So, uh, and then the message is that uh, hard work and remembering God are important. And again, we have another um, uh, genre painting of peasants in the field, and they're trying to quickly get their work done before the storm comes. All right, so that finishes us with Millet and Courbet. Any questions about those two artists? So let me introduce you to Manet. Edward Manet does not have much formal training. He has a bourgeois upbringing. Do you know, guys, have I have I used that word yet, bourgeois, in this class? Do you know what that means? When I say bourgeois, I think of rich. He was born into a wealthy family, and he's a painter, but he doesn't have to paint. He doesn't have to paint and sell his artwork. He can just paint for fun. All right, and I want you to write this term down, a flaneur, F-L-A-N-E-U-R. That might pop up on a slide later on. It should be on this slide, F-L-A-N-E-U-R. And a flaneur is a spoiled rich kid. He doesn't have to work, so he can just play around. Now, Edward Manet is going to bridge us from realism into Impressionism. He <clears throat> was successful at both. He did paintings that were realist. He did paintings that were Impressionist. Uh, so he is um, an important artist in that way. And he's a little bit different than Millet and Courbet. Millet and Courbet are, have a political message in their artworks. They're, you know, they're saying power to the people and the upper class oppresses the masses and things of that nature. And uh, Manet, he's just like, I'm just tired of history painting. So he's doing kind of his own his own stuff. There's no real social message in his art other than um, uh, there'll be a couple of things that I point out. He does have political opinions, but it's not so much about the strife between the upper and lower class. All right, so Manet is very different from Courbet and Millet. Yeah, I've just gone over all this. Let's see. He still believed that history painting is a art is he still believed painting history subjects is art of the past. He wants to paint things that are now and what is exciting in the current world. And so he looks for subjects in the world around him. And then in, and he looks for characters in the world around him. And one of the characters is this guy right here, the absinthe drinker. And this guy is a rag picker. That is his, uh, that is what he does. So I bet you're wondering, what is a rag picker? So this is a rag picker, uh, and they would they would beg for rags, and they would dig through trash for rags, and they would sell the rags to paper manufacturers. So there's a type of paper that's called rag paper, and it is a high-quality paper that does not yellow over age. In fact, I don't know if they still um, – if it's still – if they still do it, but um, dollar bills are made with rag in them, right? There's a small amount of rag in dollar bills. Anyways, back to the absinthe drinker. So this guy is a vagabond homeless character, and he makes just enough money to pay for his addictions. What is his addiction? It's alcohol, right, and drinking, and uh, his favorite thing to drink is absinthe, which I will talk about in a second. The empty bottle of absinthe in the lower right hand, uh, left hand corner and Manet is a let's see, wealthy flaneur. I already talked about that. Oh, yeah. So like I said, he was he was born rich, but he likes to pretend to be poor. He hangs out with the lower class of people because it's interesting to him. It's exciting for him. 
he's bored of the rich people that he was born into. So I bet you're wondering, what is absent? So this is absent. It's a popular alcoholic drink of the late 19th century and early 20th century. It's very strong. It's very cheap. And it was popular with Bohemians in Paris. Bohemians are artsy types, like writers, artists, musicians. And Bohemians are artistic types that don't have money or artistic types that pretend not to have money, like Manet. This drink became so popular that in Paris in the late 19th century, five to six o'clock became known as the green hour. So here's what you do. You, you have this sort of slotted spoon and you put a sugar cube on it and then you pour uh, water over the sugar cube and that sweetens and dilutes the powerful drink. It was so powerful. Uh, well, it's just it's just strong, very strong alcohol. So uh, the rest of society condemned the drink. It was very strong alcohol, like I said, and it or alcoholism ruined people's lives. And uh, Parisian society began to blame all of society's ills on absinthe, idleness, poverty, epilepsy, madness, murder. They were saying that absinthe led you straight to the madhouse or the courthouse. That was a saying at the time. And absinthe became banned in most of Europe. All right. It's also called the green fairy because people would have uh, hallucinations after drinking absinthe. All right. So back to this guy. You can see the glass of absinthe by his side and the empty bottle of absinthe at the bottom. Now. I chose this picture, one, to talk about absinthe, and two, this is a good example of the style of Manet. I want you to look at how flat this picture is, that other artists, <coughs> excuse me, are good at chiaroscuro, that they have this nice rounded shape, makes things look three-dimensional, whereas Manet paints very flatly. The brown coat or um, even like the... Uh, uh, might even just be like a, a blanket that he has wrapped around him or just fabric is very flatly painted. His pants are one solid color. The shadow on the pants is one solid color. There's no nuance in shadow and highlight in this picture. And that makes it very flat. The next painting was part of the uh, Salon de Refusé. It's this one right here. Le déjeuner sur le herbe. And everybody knows it as luncheon on the grass. If this painting shows up on the slide ID, I will give you bonus points, extra credit, if you also include the French title. All right, let's take a look at this painting. This painting is very controversial for two reasons, what was being portrayed and how it was portrayed. And the controversy is like, it's a very large painting, so it should be a history painting, but it's not a history painting. And, and one of the reasons why you can tell it's not a history painting is because they're wearing contemporary clothes, except the woman. And in painting at this time, it's okay to have a naked lady if she is a goddess or somebody in history. But to paint somebody that you know naked, that's a problem, right? And that's what is going on here, is somebody that was popular at the time. Uh, she was a popular uh, model for artists, and she was a popular uh, uh, prostitute. So people knew the model. And these people that are in the painting are not idealized. That's another thing that makes it shocking or uh, uh, distasteful, 
is that they're not idealized. She's not shown nude as an ideal of beauty. She's not shown, you know, that it's painted very ugly. There's no chiaroscuro. There's no uh, delicate nuances in the shot, in the shading, in the highlights. And then another problem is that nobody's truly interacting in this picture. Like one guy's talking to another, but the other guy's like looking away and she's looking at us. And then the lady in the background is like, I don't know, looking for fish or something. It looks like this painting is telling a story like a history painting, but it's not. There's no story going on. Like I said, in the past, the new figure would look at the viewer with a sense of coy or like with a coy expression on her face. All right. It's it's rather sexual. And she, it's almost like she's inviting you uh, closer. But this one, she's just looking at you very matter of factly. There's no coyness here. It's very casual. And that's another thing that makes it shocking. And like I said, they're not truly interacting with each other. So if you compare like this painting, Manet style of painting to former artists, you can see that lack of nuance in the shadow. There's no beauty. There's no attention. There's no love of the craft. He just paints it very flatly. And uh, it's, it's unpleasant to look at. It doesn't look natural. So um, like when you take a picture of somebody and use a flash, that, that means that the light is coming from the viewer to the subject and back. And that washes out any shadows. That's the point of a flash uh, on a camera is to wash out the shadows. And it makes everybody look flat. Whereas if you have a, uh, a your light source to the side, it creates shadows and it makes the people look more rounded. You know, the, the photograph of the woman on the right, you can see the chiaroscuro, where the photograph of the woman on the left, it, all the, any chiaroscuro is washed out. So that's why photography students have such elaborate lighting systems is to get that right. And then uh, recently, you know, people going on the internet and getting these ring lights, well, the ring light washes out any shadow that you have on your face. It makes you appear flat. And that is what is going on. It's not, I'm not saying that she's using a ring light, but the lighting is just all washed out in uh, Manet's painting. And to show you kind of like the difference, this is a painting that is done at the same time. And this artist paints in a traditional style. And they are painting uh, the birth of Venus as a beautiful woman with beautiful curves and beautiful lighting and beautiful shadows. There's a lot of attention and care trying to make her look beautiful. Uh, we see a very um, like unfinished background. It, um, the, the paint strokes are rather loose. Uh, on the background, and it almost looks like it is unfinished. For example, the bread there looks closer to being finished than the grass that it's painted on. It looks like the first layer that artists put down, and then they paint some other stuff, and they come back to it and paint the details. So she is naked, not nude. Her dress is on the ground next to her, and there's a reminder she is a modern Parisian and not Venus, born of the sea. This is not an allegory. It's not a mythological figure. She is somebody who has taken off her dress. And she wears a ribbon in her hair to accentuate her naked nakedness. Uh, to be completely nude of, of any sort of clothing is like less enticing than if you're wearing like one thing. So I remember showing you guys the uh, statue of Venus de Milo where she's half robed, like it's falling off and her upper half is nude and the lower half is uh, clothed and comparing it to a fully nude figure. And some art historians are saying that the Venus de Milo is more alluring because she's halfway nude rather than somebody that is fully nude. All right, and then look at the woman in the background. Is there something wrong with her? Is there something wrong with 
Does it look weird for any reason? What is it? Yeah, she's a little bit too big. Like it's like it's almost like bad Photoshop, where somebody doesn't understand square uh, scale as uh, uh, as much as they should. Uh, it you know as far away as it looks like it goes in the um, in the painting in the landscape, uh, it looks like she's just a little bit too big. Also, the other thing is the landscape is painted so sketchily, but she's painted a little bit more completely. She just looks out of place. It looks like she doesn't belong there, like bad Photoshop. All right, now, does this look familiar, right? So this is proof that Manet is looking at art history. So this is a famous painting by Titian, and he is referencing that painting. And he's also referencing this. So last semester, I told you the story of the uh, judgment of Paris. This is Paris. And then this is Hermes. Hermes comes down from the sky with three goddesses and asks Paris to judge which of the three goddesses is the most beautiful. There is Hera. And how do I know that that is Hera? It is because right here is a peacock, the symbol of Hera. This is Athena. How do I know that this is Athena? That he has, she has this, her helmet right here, the goddess of war. And then this is Aphrodite. How do I know that? Because he is giving her the golden apple. She wins the contest, and this is what starts the Trojan War. Up above, we have Nike. She has a wreath crowning Aphrodite, the victory uh, victor of the contest. She is the most beautiful of the three, according to Paris. Up above, we have Apollo riding his sun chariot across the sky. In front of him, we have Castor and Pollux, who later on become Gemini, uh, the constellation up in the sky. We have Zeus and Diana next to him. Also is Ganymede. Uh, I showed you the list of all of the loves or the, the uh, sexual partners of Zeus. Ganymede is one of the few uh, male sexual partners of Zeus. And there's an eagle right here. And uh, in the story, Zeus disguises himself as an eagle, uh, plucks up the young, uh, I'm hoping a young man, uh, Ganymede, not a young boy. And then he brings him up to Mount Olympus and makes him his servant. All right. But in all of this painting, I want you to look at this part right here. Does this look familiar? All right, this is, these are two river gods and a naiad. And this is almost the same composition as that of Manet. So Manet took the poses from this engraving and used it in his artwork. Moving on, we're gonna go to Olympia. Uh, this picture shows you how large Olympia is, the painting. And so here is our painting of Olympia. It features a nude woman reclining on a Shea lounge. And what else besides the new woman and the furniture is in the picture? All right, there's another woman, right? And do you see the cat? All right, the black cat. All right, but look at how the, like the black cat against the dark background. It's hard to see. Uh, the dark skin lady against the dark background it's hard to see i have lightened it up so you can see like the um the nuance of and the shading of the uh the figure all right so um she is offering a bouquet of flowers to the lady on the um uh, on the the chaise lounge and most likely it's from a male suitor and again this painting is a great insults to the academic tradition. She is a naked woman, not a nude woman. She's not mythological, allegorical, or historic. So Manet is mocking the tradition of having the nude model in recline. And these other nude ladies that are reclining it is a, you know, they are meant to be seen as beautiful. It's meant to be a challenge to the artist to make them look beautiful. And Manet is not making her look beautiful. And it's by choice. 
You know, he's he doesn't like that history painting. So he is intentionally making uh, her with the flat colors. So Manet is dissolving classical illusionism. And then look at the look on her face. It's very uh, frank. You know, she is uh, staring back at us, but not with that coy expression. And again, um, uh, the uh, black woman is a reference to the French colonialism at the time. And, and there's, and she serves also as a stark contrast to the whiteness of Olympia. All right. And it's Manet created an artistic revolution, a contemporary subject depicted in a modern manner It is hard from us in the present day to understand what the fuss was all about. Um, a little side note about the uh, figure right there on the right. She was a um, common model used by artists in the in France and Paris at that time. And she shows up in two other of Manet's paintings and she shows up in other artist paintings. So she was a popular model at the time. Her name is Loire. And the role of the black figure in painting at this time was typically that of a black attendant. And if you go back and remember the um, uh, the Raft of Medusa, how the main character in that, the one that was flagging down the boat, the hero of the picture, it was a black man. This kind of gives you a sense of why that was so different, that typically in art history at this time, black figures in art were seen as attendants or servants. How are we doing on time? All right. We're going, I, yeah, I've got, this next painting has some explaining to do. So we will start, I don't want to rush this one. So we'll start with with this. So when I ask you tomorrow, where do we leave off? You're going to say we just finished Olympia. Does anybody have any questions about anything that we have discussed? <clears throat>